is Dennis Colgavin. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Mint Data, uh, where essentially we help you turn raw data into insights. And we do it with real-time uh, stream processing. And so today I wanted to talk about uh, something that we've kind of noticed that was really the impetus behind Mint Data, which is that as an industry, we want to stop repeating ourselves. Today, we do a lot of things over and over again, and there's kind of this great dry, don't repeat yourself principle. And I think uh, combined with the Scala, we can really be much more efficient at the way that we go about uh, essentially building real-time applications and enabling uh, real-time stream processing. So this slide kind of talks about uh, that very notion, right? Uh, we think that there's a great way to dramatically reduce the time that it takes to go from really almost any raw data set uh, to insights. For example, as you saw in the last presentation uh, with text-based data and doing LSA analysis. Uh, and we feel that in a lot of cases where today we build and maintain software, there is a great opportunity to just define and run things instead for a certain category of problems. And so that's what I kind of wanted to talk about today. Uh, just a, a sample use case of, uh, you know, uh, a sample case where essentially something that would be built manually and by hand with quite a bit of effort can really be automated and make us more efficient for actually solving the problems that matter the most. So in this particular case, let's say that we have an appliance on a network. Uh, this appliance happens to serve uh, uh, responses to DNS requests from a bunch of clients. And so the clients are making DNS requests. They're getting uh, DNS responses. Now imagine that we're the vendor of this DNS appliance, and we have a lot of these appliances all over the world on lots of different networks. And so as the appliances are running, they're uh, logging essentially uh, all of the traffic, the requests, the responses uh, to some sort of a storage. Could be a flat file on the appliance. Uh, could be uh, some sort of a fancier storage system that's on the network. But essentially, we're creating uh, huge streams of logs. And so one day, someone comes to us and says, well, you know, uh, this raw data is great, but uh, the first thing we want to do is we really want to enrich this data set. So, you know, we may want to take the IP addresses and enrich them with geographical information. We may want to check uh, the DNS requests against a blacklist. Uh, to see if people are visiting sites they're not supposed to be. Uh, we may want to do some parsing for top level and second level domains uh, so that we can see essentially, you know, which requests are or which sites are more popular. And then, you know, let's say that uh, at some point a business user comes to us and says, hey, uh, I'd really like to see reports on this in real time. I'd like to understand from an operational perspective kind of how the appliances are doing. And I'd like to understand a little bit about user behavior. And so we, today, you know, we have these kinds of conversations all the time, right? We have huge streams of data, and we want to build something on top of it so that we can make decisions based on that data. And the problem is that today, we spend a lot of time between the raw data and I want to just infer insights from it. And we think that there are a lot of uh, ways that that can be improved. So for example, uh, let's say we want to build a very simple uh, real-time application. We want to build something that has uh, four pieces on the screen, or four visualizations in this case. We want to see the requests per second that are happening on the appliance. We want to see the historical request rate, so perhaps a chart of some sort. We want to see a sampling of the data to see you know, what's this appliance doing in real time. And we may want to get a geographic view to see, essentially, um, a summary of which countries are the most popular in terms of uh, where the requests are going, or perhaps even where the requests are coming from if we have a global network of these appliances deployed. And so the question becomes, how long should this take? I mean, it, it's pretty simple, right? We have you know, a bunch of appliances. They have streams of data. And we just want four simple views. I mean, this shouldn't be that complicated, right? But today, what we end up doing is we end up building quite a bit from scratch, right? So you know, here on this diagram, we have, for example, real-time data source. So in this case study, this is DNS records. But realistically, this could be ad requests on a complicated ad network. This could be a set of uh, logs. This could be events from IoT devices in the field. This could be some events uh, on, at a security company. Uh, this could be really any data that's moving. And so we have this data. The first thing we do is we hook it up to a queuing tier of some sort. So we've got Kafka's and RabbitMQ's running around. And then the next thing we do is we now have to write some custom business logic to pull things off that queue. And then we have to manage connections all the way out to a browser to make sure that all those uh, you know, fun things like, hey, somebody closed a browser tab. I'm no longer going to maintain that stream. We have to pretty much build all that stuff from scratch just to get those four views to happen. 
And so if we look at the details of the technology choices we have to make each time, is that we say, well, this is going to be a real-time application. It's going to be rich. It's going to live in the browser. So we have to pick an MVC framework. So we pick an MVC framework. Then we end up writing by hand a bunch of views, models, and controllers to drive these views. Then we have to pick the networking stack from the browser. Then we have to ha write our services layer. Then we have to potentially add caching if it's a complex enough real-time application. Then we're going to essentially pick our uh, app server tier, right? We're going to pick, for example, if we're fans of Scala, we may pick the Play framework. Uh, we may pick Servlets, JSP, really any technology. On top of that, again, we're going to write more custom logic just to kind of wire up the data. And then we're going to wire it up to some queues, add a caching layer, so something like Hazelcast or Gemfire, for example, if the app is complex enough. Then we're going to add some relational storage, potentially talk to some big data systems for file systems, columnar storage, uh, for document-oriented uh, document storage. And so we have all these choices, and we end up using a lot of these systems in pretty complex scenarios. But all we wanted was just a simple real-time app. And so the question becomes, why do we do this? Well, as developers, we want control and flexibility. We want the ability to choose the best of breed systems because we want to build robust and scalable applications that at the end of the day will be easy to maintain and will have low technical debt. So that when someone comes to us and says, hey, the requirements have changed or we want to build something different, we can say, well, we have the best tools of the trade. We can actually uh, easily make these changes. But business users, on the other hand, all they care about is the lowest development time and cost, right? So what they really care about is, you know, how quickly can get this built? I don't really care about uh, so, sort of all the stuff that's happening inside. And so at Mint Data, we feel that there is a way to satisfy the needs of both people at the same time. And so we think that it's uh, possible to do this with Scala and with quite a bit of infrastructure that automates a lot of the things that are unnecessary, but without removing the flexibility that we're used to as a developer. So this is just a quick slide about, uh, about our background. So we come from a consulting background where essentially we have built a number of low latency, high throughput systems. And in our experience, we saw ourselves building the same things over and over and over again. And Mint Data was born out of that frustration as a desire to automate the things that don't matter while still leaving us with the flexibility for the things that do. So if we have the original architecture, with the queuing tier, the web tier, the connection tier, and browsers, and a, a real-time uh, uh, data source. This can actually be uh, improved and automated for the things that are uh, interesting. So in a world with stream processing platforms, whether it's Mint Data or something else, we feel that the future will lead us to these two components here on the left. So we'll have stream processing runtimes. Uh, how many people here are familiar with Apache Storm? OK, so quite a few. So by stream processing runtimes, I think that they're here to stay. I think the general paradigm of having essentially what we call components or what Storm calls uh, spouts and bolts, I think it's a, it's a very powerful way to distribute logic to run it on a cluster, to run it with uh, data at very, very low latencies measured in milliseconds, to do you know, millions of events on a JVM. This stuff is, is here to stay. But what's interesting about it is that once you're doing all of that processing, how do you actually get it to the end user? How do you actually get people to benefit from that? And so we think that in the future, there's going to be quite a bit of infrastructure, something we're calling stream processing platforms, that will take care of all the glue in the same way that we don't write operating systems today, we don't write relational databases today. We think there's going to be quite a bit of infrastructure in that place. And so in particular, the way that we think about this is that there should be very powerful tooling for defining the application logic. In other words, for defining what Storm would call a topology, what on our runtime that we built from scratch we would call it design. We think that this should be very straightforward to define. In this case, you know, we've built some components in Scala that we'll show in the demo. And this should be done either visually or programmatically, depending on whether you're writing unit tests or whether you have a business analyst uh, creating this. And once you've defined this logic, you've essentially created the stream processing design then it should be just as easy to define the views for visualizing this data in the browser. And it should be very straightforward to actually get inputs from a user to actually drive the application. So we think that dashboards are broken. Dashboards kind of encourage people to have a one-way conversation with their data. They visualize the data. Perhaps they can drill down on it a little bit. But there's a very big difference between a dashboard and a true full-fledged real-time application. And today, as soon as we say 
we want to build a real-time application, we build it from scratch. And we think that's broken. We think it could be much more efficient. And we'll show an example of how that works. And so the next thing is we want to be able to flexibly spin up clusters. We want to no longer have a bunch of DevOps and scotch tape to spin up these clusters for different environments and control access for users and so on. All of this should be automated in part of the infrastructure so that we can get on with the business of the things that actually matter to us, which is inferring insights from our data. And so at the end of the day, all we want to do is deliver an application to end users. So in the case of Mint Data, this is a slide that talks about the architecture of how we envision uh, a future like this happening, and in fact, what we've built out. So at the very core of this is the Mint Data runtime. The Mint Data runtime is uh, backwards compatible with Apache Storm, but was built from the ground up to be much more performant, both, both from a latency and throughput perspective. Um, and it's essentially, conceptually, uh, a very similar thing to Apache Storm. You have components, you have stream processing, you have a clustered runtime that's able to process data at very high rates. And this can run both on-premise and uh, in the cloud. Then you have something that we call the Mint Data Workspace. So this is the place where you can centrally manage clusters and environments, manage permissions, manage which designs are being deployed, the history of designs, data provenance, and so on. Then you have the Visual Designer. So this is the place where you can actually visually define what you want to do, as well as defining the visualizations that you want to hook up to the runtime so that you can empower business users to actually very quickly make decisions. And then the last thing that we have are the Mint Data real-time applications. So we'll show an example of this in a second, but this is essentially what a business user will consume, and to them it will look like something that took months uh, or perhaps many months to build, but in reality on Mint Data can take just a number of hours or days. So with that, I wanted to kind of briefly jump to a demo, and we can actually see this working in practice. So here we're in the workspace application. We've opened up a design, and we're going to add a component set. So we're adding a component set under the covers. This is just a Maven artifact. So uh, these components happen to be built in Scala. They could build, uh, be built in Java. Uh, we could even uh, invoke something like Python under the covers. And so now, now that we've added a component set, we can actually very quickly start to drag and drop these blocks. And each of these blocks, we'll take a look in a second uh, of the code that's uh, behind all of this, but each of these blocks is mapped one to one to a Scala class, or it could be a Java class. And so each of these blocks has inputs, has outputs, has properties, and also configurational aspects, essentially fields that can be injected using dependency injection. So for example, we uh, did a talk at a meetup a couple weeks ago where we literally integrated Apache Spark onto our platform in one day because it was just a matter of injecting a Spark context into one of our blocks and then having a data frame operator be a block on this platform where you could define the types of data frame operations you want to perform. In this particular case, uh, we actually we rewrote all of this, uh, uh, these components for this meetup to prove that this can work uh, all in Scala. So here we have a message generator. It's generating uh, some dummy DNS data. Then we're enriching the data uh, with the GeoIP database. Uh, then we're doing some domain parsing in the domain enrichment block. Um, then we're doing, let's see what else are we doing. Then we're uh, doing some blacklist checking. We're adding a utility component set in this case. Uh, the utility component set, this is actually a pretty interesting thing. So if you have a high performance stream processing runtime that's processing millions of events per second, there's no way that you can get all that data to the browser to visualize, nor would you want to. And so uh, on our platform, it's just, you know, you can have a couple of utility components that slow down the data. They sample it, they take a top end analysis, and once they've slowed it down, then they'll actually take that down to the browser. So in this case, uh, what we've done is we've switched to the visual view for building real-time apps. And here, we're very much uh, dragging and dropping uh, visual controls. And all of these controls are just pure HTML5. So if we wanted to, we could build a number of other controls uh, in any uh, favorite uh, client-side framework, and we'd have more opportunities to both visualize data, but also to gather inputs from the user and put it back into the stream processing runtime. So in this particular case, we're going to set up the gauge control, configure a couple of settings, bind it to the data model, and then in a couple of uh, minutes, we'll see how all of this comes together, where basically we've uh, created a real-time application, in, in this case, in seven minutes, instead of something that could take days. So in this particular case, we're, uh, we're setting up a table control, setting up the columns, uh, we're binding it to the data model. Uh, on our platform, for example, all of the messages that are going back and forth are strongly typed. Uh, and so you have a very clear notion of what's happening uh, between your stream processing components. 
And if you do need something that's weakly typed, we also have the notion of message properties. So this is a weakly typed uh, piece of key value uh, data that you can pass along with each message if you wanted to, but essentially uh, is used typically for things like session IDs, user IDs, and so on. So in this case, we're setting up the chart component, we're binding it to the data model, we're setting up the axes, uh, we're essentially uh, doing the data binding portion of this uh, so that we can hook it up to the what's going to be happening in the runtime uh, on a cluster and actually get all this to work end to end. So the last thing is we'll configure, for example, the map component uh, and we have uh, typically two modes, replace uh, or append, so uh, depending on what we want to do with incoming data. So here we're going to pick, for example, the, the map of the world, we're going to uh, map it to the, the data model again uh, and essentially once we hit apply, uh, in this case, we want to replace, so we want to see kind of just a real-time view of which countries are being hit the most. And so now what we've done is for all the visual controls that we've dropped uh, in the real-time view, we actually have these uh, dotted components uh, or com components with dashes that represent the visual things that we just drew. And so now that we have those visualizations, it's a matter of saying, okay, here's where they fit into the logic. And once we hit run, all of this will just kind of automatically through the workspace infrastructure be streamed down to the browser and you know we'll be able to share the resulting application as easily as a Google Doc. So in this case we're going to configure a couple more things um, and basically in, in a few seconds we'll, we'll, we'll get to the point where we can actually run this um, uh, and, and see everything uh, happening live. So while this uh, video is running, any, any questions or thoughts at this point? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, right now, sure. So the question was, uh, is this open source? Yeah. So right now, this is a commercial product from Mint Data, and over time, we have plans to open source uh, large portions of it. So for example, the, a lot of the core platform components, uh, I think in the future, uh, you will see open source. Yeah. So, so so the question is, is there any state in the system? That's actually a very uh, important architectural decision. So. In the case of the Mint Data runtime, we feel that if you want to have stateful processing, you can, but it shouldn't be at the level of the engine. So for example, there are engines out there that will, behind the scenes, try to snapshot state, they'll try to replay state. Um, we feel that, that that shouldn't be in the engine, it should be at the level of platform components. So in our components, yes, there are a number of stateful components, there are a number of NoSQL engines that we integrate with. Um, there are a number of things like Hazelcast, you know, for example, if you wanted to have a shared uh, cache on the cluster that you could run. But we, we feel very strongly that this should not be in the engine itself. Because, for example, you know, the world we come from is financial services data, where you have easily over a million messages per second uh, coming into a cluster, and you can't lose a single message, and essentially uh, both throughput and latency matters. And so, in some cases, you can't afford to save that state um, un until you've actually done the processing. And so, uh, so in the case of our engine, everything is done. Uh, there, are no there are no assumptions that are made uh, for you uh, at, the, at the engine level. So when you're talking about like top end, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about top end, uh, let's say I'm running for a day, I need to maintain this top end somewhere. I need to add Cassandra, Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So you would add the best of breed component that you felt was right for the job. So if you wanted to do top end, you could do a window based analysis based on some short time interval, and that you would typically do uh, in an in-memory fashion. If you had a business requirement to do this on a longer interval, then you would use something like Cassandra. It would, it would really be based on the, the, the data that you have at hand. Okay. So uh, let's see, other questions before I dive into the code? Okay, so uh, let's take a quick peek at what it takes to write one of these components. So in our case, uh, we felt very strongly about the fact that we want to change as little as possible about the way that code is written today. So for example, in the case of a printer component, it's just a matter of dropping a single annotation. And for all the inputs that are going into the blocks, we drop an input annotation, it becomes a method. For all of the output components, uh, for example, for components that have outputs, 
it's a matter of dropping an output annotation. So for example, if we want to take a, sent a sentence that's coming in, split it on spaces and emit a bunch of messages for each word that's coming out, it would literally be as simple as dropping an output annotation, an input for the sentence uh, messages that are coming in, and simply splitting it. Um, and there's also dependency injection happening under the covers. So for example, if I have a random sentence component, I have the ability to have uh, a config annotation. So this allows me to do dependency injection for any piece of functionality into a platform component. And so for example, this is how we took Apache Spark and integrated it within one day on the platform. We literally took a Spark context, wrapped it in this config mechanism, and we had an in-memory uh, small version of Spark running on each Mint Data JVM literally within a day, taking advantage of the data frame operators. And so any Scala or Java technology is literally at your fingertips within uh, one annotation and one wrapper class to be able to inject. So other, other questions on kind of uh, the things that we've shown? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, it's a couple of things. Uh, we used to build a lot of systems on top of Apache Storm. Um, and so one of the things is that uh, we've anecdotally seen that uh, the stack trace, if you look at Storm, uh, or, or the call stack rather, at any given moment in time is substantially larger than on our runtime. So there's simply more things going on uh, in Storm. Um, that's one of the things we've noticed. The other thing is that uh, Storm under the covers, um, they're, they're using threading uh, in a slightly different way. So they essentially, between two components, uh, they have a transfer queue. So they will have basically a context switch between threads when one component is emitting you'll have a context switch to this transfer queue, the thread that's processing it, and then you'll have from that thread another context switch to the thread of the downstream component from it. Uh, that obviously is very expensive, uh, and it's also unnecessary. In the case of Storm, the best that we can gather from it is that they were concerned about feedback loops, um, but there are more elegant ways of, of dealing with that scenario. So on our platform, you can obviously have, you know, you can draw the arrow as a feedback loop, that's not a problem. Um, but we're not entirely sure as to why they have that additional uh, queue for transferring uh, messages between components. Uh, we've seen that's another case uh, for latency. Um, but yeah, I mean, if, if you reach out to us, we have you know, two zip files you can download, one with Storm, one with our runtime, uh, and basically you can see all the sources, run the two demos and see exactly uh, you know, on your laptop or on your infrastructure, uh, you can actually see us prove out the fact that it's uh, faster than Storm. Other questions? So, you're saying network compatible with Storm, so if there is this Storm, like this chain of messages and icons? Correct. If you wanted to, you could. Uh, so, if you build components uh, using these annotations and run them on the Mint Data platform, if you really wanted to, we could give you an adapter that would allow you to run it on a Storm cluster. Um, we have reasons why we wouldn't recommend it, but it's there kind of as a uh, psychological safety guarantee that if you really wanted to, you could run it on a storm cluster. Yeah, so if you, if you have existing uh, code that runs uh, on a storm cluster, it's very straightforward to run it on Mint Data. All you would do is you would add these annotations to your spouts and bolts, and they would magically become things that you can drag, drop, connect visually, wire to the charting and visualization components, and you'd be off and running. So it's not automated, but by dropping a few annotations, you could get there very quickly. Ah, that's a good question. That's probably for our engineers. Um, I know that for, for all three cases, they've managed a, a way to implement it. Um, I, I don't know the specifics, but um, if you follow up with me by email, I can get you an exact explanation. Uh, this is a bit original question. Ah, uh, so the question was, how do we implement exactly once guarantees? Correct. So this, yes. So semantically, it would be similar to, to what Trident provides in the case of Storm. So, what about the infrastructure on Storm? 
Yeah, so the, the question was around uh, kind of infrastructure, so our ability to interface with external systems. Um, so that's actually one of the, the shining lights of uh, Mint Data. We ship with quite a number of components out of the box, and you can pretty much interact with most of the big data systems today without having to rewrite that same glue code that you end up writing over and over uh, for different applications. So our ability to work with sort of any NoSQL engine, columnar storage, queuing system, relational database, uh, all those things are uh, incredibly straightforward and fast to do because you just drop existing blocks and you're up and running very quickly. Other questions? Okay, great, thank you. Oh. How do you support fault tolerance? So for fault? Ah, so uh, do we support uh, fault tolerance? Yes. Uh, so uh, when it's running in a clustered mode, uh, we have the notion of workload sharing. So for example, uh, we have the same notion as parallelism hints uh, as Storm does. Uh, so for example, when you're running this in a cluster, uh, if a node dies, the existing nodes uh, will take on the workload of that existing component. If a new component joins the cluster, it will, the, the existing uh, uh, nodes, the existing JVMs in the cluster will share, uh, they will essentially shed some of their workload, some of the component instances that are running, and that new node will pick up those instances, activate them, and they will become active on the cluster. The way you would typically handle that is you would essentially, uh, there are, you can implement a callback listener. So if you're reading from a queue, uh, you typically wouldn't acknowledge to that queue until you know that you've fully completed the stream processing. So if you implement a single interface on our platform, we use actually a very similar uh, mathematics to Storm and for the XOR logic under the covers, so that when it reaches zero, we know that the message has not spawned any more child messages and that all the processing for that particular source message has completed. Uh, and so then you can acknowledge it to the queue. So that's typically how you would handle this as opposed to trying to replay or, or magically replicate the data. Uh, we did that on purpose because if we built those kind of guarantees into the engine, uh, they would kind of come to bite you in terms of performance for the cases where everything is running correctly. So we find that the best way is to, let, to not acknowledge to the queue that you're typically reading from until it's fully processed. And if something died in between, then the queue will e either you'll reread from the queue or the queue will replay it to you. Ah, great question. So uh, in theory, yes, this could run on Mesos with a very straightforward adapter. So same thing for Mesos, for Yarn. Uh, it's a, a very lightweight uh, sort of JVM-based runtime. So anything that allows uh, Java code to run, uh, even for embedded systems, um, this would be a good candidate. Does the theory mean you've never done it? Correct. Or, okay, just check. <laughs> All questions? Thanks. Okay, thank you.